In the days following Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples and led them to preach the gospel in all places and to all people. As the good news of salvation spread and the early church grew, they faced new challenges and had to articulate their newfound faith. From the ascension of Christ and salvation for unexpected people to shipwrecks and testimony before kings, the Book of Acts has much to teach us about living by the Spirit in a culture that prioritizes self. Join us as we explore who the church is and how it functions, witnessing the passion of the early believers as they fearlessly preached the gospel, breaking barriers and reaching out to all corners of the world. Long ago, there was a man named Saul who did everything in his power to stop people from following Jesus. He was sure that the followers of Jesus were the enemies of God. He put many of them in prison, and some of them were even killed. Sometime later, Saul and his companions were headed for the city of Damascus where they planned to arrest the followers of Jesus. Suddenly, a bright light flashed around Saul. He fell to the ground in fear and heard a voice ask him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul responded, Who are you, Lord? The voice answered, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus told him to get up and go into the city where he would be told what he should do. So Saul got up, but he couldn't see. He was blind. His companions had to lead him by the hand into Damascus to a disciple named Ananias. Jesus told Ananias that he should lay hands on Saul, but Ananias was afraid. He had heard of all the things that Saul had been doing to the followers of Jesus. Jesus assured him that Saul had changed and that God had important work for Saul to do. Ananias obeyed Jesus. He found Saul and laid his hands on him. Then Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit, and something like scales fell from his eyes. Now he could see once again. Then Ananias baptized Saul. Saul was transformed, and his new name was now Paul. As you can see, we're continuing our series in the book of Acts. And just a side note as we begin, all the men up at Men's Adventure are safe if you're worried. <laughs> I was up there this weekend. Tim and I came back yesterday, and God is doing an incredible work up there. And so they're worshiping as we're worshiping together, so we're still one. But we here this morning get to continue in the book of Acts. And we've seen so many incredible things so far in the book of Acts. Uh, the Holy Spirit's been poured out. There's miracles. There's people coming to faith. But most recently, last week, if you were here, what we saw was God using Philip, who was one of the seven that was appointed to, to wait on tables where we get our deacons from, he was going out, and he was preaching the gospel. Remember, he met up, he preached the gospel in Samaria, and then we see him uh, show up in another place where this Ethiopian eunuch comes to know Jesus. Right? So people who have been kind of on the outside of people who wouldn't be able to normally be part of uh, Israel kind of worship, they're being pulled into God's kingdom. And so what we're seeing is that the thing that Jesus called the church to do is actually happening. The gospel is going out from Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth, right, going all the way down into Africa. And so the thing is going out. But the second thing is happening too is it's going out because the church is being persecuted. So this, this seems really exciting, but there's people who are not so excited about this new way of Jesus. In fact, they want to try to snuff this thing out as much as they can. Picture a, a campfire or something, and they're trying to get it out, but what's happening is it's actually pushing the embers out and they're igniting, and so the church is going out, and God is using these hard things to accomplish good purposes, which is difficult for us. And Pastor Don talked about that last week, the difficulty of things that happen in our lives that God can use for good, but they don't necessarily feel good. And you feel the tension, and all of us know what that's like. And so the gospel is going out. And today is really incredible because we get to see this story where God does something that we don't see all the time. We're going to see someone who's like the villain, the bad guy. 
Yes, he's going to become a good guy. Right, we see this in movies sometimes. We've got, we have, a, our kids are in with us, right? So uh, kids, this would be like uh, Despicable Me, right? Or Gru the villain comes the good guy. And it takes a while for you to believe that he's the good guy. And he still has maybe some bad guy qualities, right? But he becomes a good guy. Or for adults, I don't know. Uh, it'd be like, <laughs> this is a bad example. I apologize. Probably shouldn't say it, but whatever. It's like Terminator 2, where Arnold Schwarzenegger comes back as the good guy, but he looks like the bad guy, and everyone's confused. Don't go see the movie, but I'm just saying, it's a reference. But when the bad guy takes all of his passion and zeal and excitement and turns it from bad stuff and puts it towards good stuff, toward the gospel, it changes the entire landscape. Saul, who we're going to know as Paul, completely changes everything. And I would say to you, we are sitting here today because God called him. It's an incredible story. And what we're going to see is that Jesus does this work of calling Saul. Jesus calls us. He saves us. But he uses other people, his church, as part of that process to welcome people into God's kingdom. So I want to start uh, just be four things I want to say to you this morning specifically. We have a big problem in the text, and the big problem is this. The church is being persecuted. So I'm going to read the text, this first two verses. It says this, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest. He's asking um, for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way or to the church, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. There's this kind of anti-Jesus movement going on, and the guy who's at the top of this thing is Saul, right? He's got pins made up. He's got ads in the paper. He is like going after. He wants to take this thing out. He's doing everything in his power to stop this new move of Jesus. And it's interesting because Luke says he's breathing out murderous threats. It's really like a descriptive word. It's actually it's the only time in the whole New Testament that that verb is used. Right now, every one of us are breathing, I think, for the most part. We don't even think about it. Breathing in and out. But think about, he is, it's like he's fully consumed with his hatred towards this thing. Breathing in and out, right? The early church is breathing in and out the Holy Spirit. Saul is breathing out murderous threats. He's all consumed. That's all that he can see. He's extremely zealous, right? He is all in. If you're going to fault him, you can't say he's not committed. He's kind of committed to the wrong thing, but he's fully committed. In fact, he's like a guy in the book of Numbers. There was a guy named Phinehas. Some of you may know this story. But some of you may not. But he is the grandson of Aaron, who was the brother of Moses. And he's the high priest, and the Israelites in Numbers, they, this is right after the Balaam's donkey stuff, if that helps. And they start hanging out with these Moabites when they're not supposed to, and they start doing stuff with them that they shouldn't do, uh, that they're not supposed to do. And God sends a plague to stop this thing. And like a lot of people are getting sick and dying. And this guy Phinehas decides to step in and he takes judgment out on a particular Israelite and a Moabitess woman and takes them out, and God honors that because it stops the plague, and God rewards his zeal, his action. And so you got to imagine, Saul knows about people like that in the Bible. He thinks that God's going to honor him for what he's doing to this early church because he thinks he's in the right. He's a man that not only says things, but is doing things, but the problem is he's consumed by the wrong thing. And when we are, this is one of your feelings, when we're all consumed by anything other than Jesus, people get hurt. When we take anything, even good things, to their full extreme, apart from Christ, people get hurt. And we know that this is true in our own lives. We know that this is true. And so Saul is, he is charging forward full throttle. I was up at Men's Adventure, so I was thinking about this. You know, I picture, I, uh, two years ago, I, I jeeped with uh, Ryan Bykirk and Jeremy Zido and, Jer and uh, Ryan's Jeep. And it was the most exciting, terrifying thing I've ever experienced in my life, right? 
Ryan was in full control, Julie, totally safe. And we're just like, some people are like crawling up stuff. And Ryan's like, no, we just go for it. <laughs> like going up this thing, right? Or if you've ever been to Disneyland, you've been on the Indiana Jones ride. Like you're just like bouncing around, but you're just like, we are not going to stop until we reach the top. And that's what the picture you get with Saul. He is just going. And the picture from the text is like, Saul is going to just keep going out and out to get these people. This is only the beginning of what Saul wants to do if he has his way. And the church has no way to stop this because he's getting authority from the religious leaders. And so it feels like an impossible situation. And it is because they don't know what to do. And so what we see here, this amazing thing that happens is that Jesus himself steps in to stop this persecution. That's the second thing we see. We see the solution, which is that Jesus intervenes. And this is what happens. Verse 3, as they neared Damascus, suddenly a light shone from heaven. It flashed around him. And, and, and Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city. You'll be told what you must do. And he's blinded, and he has to have people take him into Damascus. Jesus himself steps in, and he's like, The guy who's in full control gets brought to his knees, he's blinded, and he can't do anything about it. Jesus steps in and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul's like, what? Who? Like, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And he doesn't, Jesus doesn't say, hey, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you persecuting my apostles? Why are you persecuting Mary or Joseph or, you know, pick a person? He says, why are you persecuting me? Which I would think Saul might be a little bit confused by that. See, because Jesus is one with his church. To persecute the church is to persecute Jesus himself. Think about that. An attack on his church is an attack on him. If you don't believe me, I'm sure you do, but just in case you don't, here's a couple verses. This is what Jesus prays in John 17. Listen to the kind of the unity. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. He's talking about us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I'm in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. It's kind of confusing, but it's this big kind of swirling unity thing where we're getting brought in with Jesus and the Father and the Spirit, and it's hard to understand, but there's a oneness happening there. Later in in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives the parable of the sheep and the goats. And Jesus starts talking about, he's kind of rewarding people for these things that they did to the least of these, the way that they treated people. And they're like, when did we do that? And Jesus says this to them. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me. And he says the opposite later. Whatever you didn't do for the least of these, you didn't do for me as well. And so Jesus sees himself as intimately connected to his church forever. We have been bought. We belong to him. And what's interesting is that Saul doesn't know that the very God he's serving, he's also persecuting. Isn't that ironic? I mean, I think we've been in situations like that sometimes where we thought, you thought you were right. (laughs) You were sure. You're passionate, you're zealous. You were wrong. And sometimes it's funny, (laughs) and sometimes it's not. And sometimes there's big consequences for those things. I think of, this actually happened a couple weeks ago, right? So I do some of the music, right? And I like to memorize the music. I don't like to have music sheets and stuff, whatever. So I can be like in the moment, you know, whatever. And uh, (laughs) I thought for sure the second song was one song. And then as soon as Ryan started playing drums, I realized really quickly that I was not playing the same song the rest of the team was. I was, I knew the song. I was right in my head. I was wrong in reality. Or if you've been to, our kids just finished a basketball league 
You see this with little kids, right? A kid gets the ball, they finally get the ball, they go to shoot it, and they shoot it in the opponent's basket. And everybody doesn't know if they should clap or laugh, right? And you're like, yes, you just lost the game for us. You know, it's like the consequence, it's good, but it's like, it's a bad consequence. My kids didn't do that, it was other kids. Um, They know the difference. Uh, No offense to anybody who's done that. But we can have, we think we're right sometimes and we're just not. And so Paul, Saul thinks he's right, but he's not. And he's hurting the church. And I, I would just say this as a side note. It would be wise for us to remember that when we attack God's people, we're actually attacking himself. The way that we treat each other Think about things you've said to someone. Would you say that to Jesus? Right? I'm scared just saying that. (laughs) The way that we treat each other, when we uh, want our own way, when we're not showing love, when we're unwilling to forgive someone, we don't, think about that you're showing that to Christ himself. It should make us think about how we interact with each other and what our witness ultimately is to the world around us. And so, in the story, Saul, the, the tables have totally turned. The guy who was once leading people in chains is now on his knees, leveled, completely humbled. And it's likely that Saul would have seen or heard Jesus when Jesus was in his earthly ministry. He may have heard him preach. He certainly might have been in circles where they were talking about this new rabbi Jesus who's messing everything up. He probably knew about Jesus, but to know Jesus to hear some things about him is not the same as to have an encounter or an experience with Jesus himself. And this experience leaves Saul completely humbled. In fact, his name is going to change, and it doesn't tell us totally in the text why it happens, but Saul means desired one, right? So Saul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Saul was smart. Saul had power, authority. He's desired. Paul no offense to anybody who's named Paul, means small. But aren't we all small before the God of the universe? Even his name shows the change that he has, that he now understands who he is in, in relationship to God. He's completely humbled. It dismantles his current life. Ironically, it took him be, being blind to be able to see. He has to get blinded to finally wake up. I'm sure we all have things that we probably are blind to. But the story doesn't stop there. He has this encounter with Jesus. He's blind. He's being led to Damascus. But he still has nowhere to go. And so we get introduced to this other character in the story, this guy, Ananias. And this is where the story gets interesting, I think. Verse 10, it says, in Damascus, there's a disciple named Ananias. And he calls out, Jesus calls to him, Lord, I'm here. This is what Jesus says. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Ask for a man of Tarsus named Saul. He's praying. In the vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and lay hands on him. Ananias says, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to you and your holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name, which is exactly true. The Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer in my name. When I was spending time reading and thinking about this passage, I was kind of struck by why Ananias is here. And this is our third point, that the church gets involved. Ananias is called to help. The question is why? Why involve another person in this? If Jesus can show up in light and a voice, like, you know, like stuff God does in the Old Testament, all these things, and he can save him, why does he need Ananias to do anything? It's just gonna make it complicated. Why is he there? I think if we look at some of the things that Ananias does, we start to get a little insight on what's happening here. Ananias is brought in to do three main things. The first is this. He's called to lay hands on Saul so he can receive his sight again. He's called to lay hands on him and baptize him. He baptizes him in water, and then he's baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then third, Ananias welcomes Saul into the family of God. 
These are all things that humans do. People with bodies, hands and feet. Right? Remember, we talked about Jesus is ascended to heaven. His physical body goes up into heaven, which is like crazy. And he sends his Holy Spirit. So Jesus is, you know, up there, however you want to talk about that. We're here. People filled with the Spirit are here. And Jesus is like, I need my body to go do things. I need you to go lay hands on this man and be me for him. Because people, the church baptizes, right? The church prays for people. The church welcomes people into the family. This isn't just some spiritual religion we have. This is embodied. We're physical beings and spiritual beings. We need both. So Saul has to be welcomed, saved by Jesus, but he also has to be welcomed by the church. But like all of us, Ananias is like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I've heard about this dude. Remember, he's a villain, right, kids? He's like grew before. He's like on the bad guy list. He's a bad dude who does bad dude things. And Ananias is nervous and worried. He probably knows people who were put in prison. Remember, Saul has been separated. He's been going after men, women. Think about what that means. If men and women, if families are separated, there's no income, no one's taking care of kids. What happens to kids? economically what is happening like this is bad stuff that's happening this is not just some like yeah he was just kind of mean to me or whatever this guy's done really horrible things remember he was there consenting to Stephen's death and so Ananias is nervous and you know what I would be too I would be too because Saul's the enemy right well kind of Maybe not totally. We learn in a letter that Saul, who becomes Paul, writes that it's actually rulers and powers and principalities and these spiritual forces that that are the actual enemy. He says that in Ephesians chapter 6. So Saul looks like the enemy. He sounds like the enemy. Sure, doing like bad things. But people are not the enemy. People have been made in God's image. It's one of your feelings. People have been made in the image of God. We have not been made to be enemies of God. If someone has been made in the image of God, then they can be redeemed by Jesus. And so we have to remember that people are not the enemy. Sometimes it feels that way. But they've been made in the image of God just as we have. And so even though Saul's been doing these hard things, he's been kind of a conduit for bad things, Jesus is saying, no, no, you're going to become a conduit for grace and for mercy, and I'm going to show you what it means to suffer in my name. And therefore, Jesus says, Ananias, go. Imperative command. I'm not asking anymore. I'm telling you, you need to go to him. And Ananias has a choice. Is he going to trust Jesus? Does Jesus know what he's doing? Now, it sounds like an obvious question, but I'm sure we've all questioned Jesus and questioned God in our life. I, sh- I hope I'm not the only one. Are you, really, are you sure you want me to go there? Are you sure about that person? Like, I've seen him before. You know, can Ananias trust Jesus over his experiences, over the rumors, over the pain? I don't say this lightly. These are difficult things. We have to do these things too. Can we let go of stuff? Can we trust that Jesus knows more about justice and fairness than we do? And Ananias is struggling with this. And I think we do too. And it's important because there are times when we stand in the way of what God is wanting to do. Now God will have his way. But don't you want to be part of it? and not be the person pushing against it, thinking, well, God, I know you show mercy and grace, and I love that because I want that, but I don't know about that one. (laughs) Like, let's have some limits on what you do here. One of the things I love about Men's Adventure is there's guys who go up, and they're like the Jeep guys and the hiker guys and the fisherman guys who get up so early, the bike guys, the golf guys. And when you get up there, maybe your first time, you're like, I don't know where I fit in with this. Like, I'm not like... I'm not like into all that stuff. 
And what you find out is all of these guys wanted to share all their stuff with everybody. They don't care if you like Jeepy, and they're like, come, get in. I got a seat for you. I've never met you before. It doesn't matter. Oh, we're running a boat. You don't fish? Come. Come get up. Come fish with us. I already rented a boat. They're so hospitable. They just welcome people. These are guys that are totally different. And it doesn't matter. They look different. They sound different. Maybe they talk different. Maybe they smell different. It doesn't matter. And that's kind of the call that Ananias is giving. I know he's different. I know what he's done. He says, I, I got this. Are you willing to trust me over your feelings or your insecurities? And this is so important because God wants to use us, you and me, regardless of our age, for his conduits, for his grace and mercy, to actually share his gospel message. And this is the last point. The gospel comes through the church. Saul gets baptized. So it says in verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Listen to this. Think about what we've been saying about Ananias. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see. He got up, he was baptized, and after taking some food, he received his strength. It's easy to kind of miss out because Saul is going to go on to be the greatest missionary the church has ever seen. Right? This guy just attacks it. He's all over the place. He's completely filled. But what's so incredible is that he becomes part of this new way. He becomes a brother. He becomes family. He's going to go do these amazing things. But he becomes a family member. Ananias calls them brother or Adelphi in the Greek. It, this is something you would say to your brother or people that you love, people that you care about, people you trust. And Ananias, the guy that's been struggling, right, lays his hands on him and says, Brother Saul. Ananias was able to trust Jesus and get past him. He may still have been struggling. But he was willing to still be obedient even in that struggle, which I think is really beautiful. And Saul's not welcomed necessarily into some kind of like institution. He's welcome into a family. And this body of Christ is where all of us get to be welcomed in, where we get new identities as children of God, right? Whoever we once were, we're no longer, we're washed. Our sins are forgiven. Saul, who's done these horrible things. Those things are cleansed. That doesn't mean he forgets who he was. If you read the New Testament, Saul will bring up many times how he persecuted the church, how he is the chief of sinners. But then he'll say things like this, I have been crucified with Christ. It's Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In this life I live now by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. His identity is completely reversed. He knows who he was, but that causes him to be, have so much gratitude for what Jesus has done for him. It causes him to move forward because he's not what he once was. He is now who Jesus says that he is. And what's so cool, remember we talked about the breathing? Right? You picture Saul in the beginning, just like, he's just like getting so amped like people before, like a football game or something, you know? breathing in these murderous threats, and now at the end, he is breathing in the Holy Spirit, completely changed, completely changed because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel changes Saul's life in every single way, and I want to say to you today, no one is too far gone. There are people that we are praying for, that we've been praying for for a long time. It could be a spouse, it could be a family member, it could be a child, it could be a friend, it could be a neighbor, it could be a grandparent. Don't stop praying for them. They may be on the road to Damascus right now, 
but maybe that road is actually like Riverside Drive or Euclid or whatever, you know, contextualize it. Don't stop. Saul is this example that no one is beyond redemption. And the flip for us, those of us who are believers in Christ, is to remember that, like Ananias, God is calling us to go put our hands on people and to pray for people. And that might look like being a good neighbor. And that might look like being a really hospitable coworker. It might happen when you're dropping your kids off at school. It might happen at the workplace. It's happening around here. In all of the ordinary stuff of life, what is God calling you to? Are we willing to have our eyes open to that? Because the gospel of Jesus, this is your last film, the gospel of Jesus Christ through the people of God is the answer to everything. The plan, Jesus' plan, is that he has sacrificed for us. He has given us his spirit, and he is making all things new. I guarantee you, if every Christian on this planet started breathing in the Holy Spirit every day, this world would completely change. It is the answer. So, a couple questions to think about as we begin to close. Are we willing to believe that people can be made new? In two ways. Some of us here struggle with that personally. You hear the words, you believe that Jesus has saved you, that he's redeemed you, but you are struggling to really internalize that to believe. Can I really be forgiven of my past? Can I really be forgiven of last week? Can I be made new? And I would say to you, yes, you can. Also, do you believe that for other people? Do you believe that for your neighbor whose dog barks all the time and drives you crazy? You know, the guy doesn't cut his lawn, whatever. Do we believe that for other people? Or do we just believe that for ourselves? Because if that's the case, that's pretty selfish. Can we believe that for other people? And then also, are we willing to be sent to people that aren't like us? We all have biases. Not a single person in here doesn't have them. It's human to have those things. But are we willing, like Ananias, to trust Jesus that he knows what he's doing? And all we have to do is have a willing heart and trust him as we step into our lives. Perhaps another way of thinking about this is where in our lives are we blind? Right? Both Saul and Ananias were blind in ways. Saul's were, well, I mean, he actually was blind. Uh, but he was blind to what he was doing. And Ananias was a little bit blind to a narrower view of God that he didn't want to let go of. But both of them allowed Jesus to break through and give them a greater vision of what he was doing. And are we willing today to let Jesus give us a bigger vision? We, trust me, you don't want your vision to come true on this earth. We want Jesus' vision to come true on this earth. Because even in our best intentions, <laughs> we're going to mess this whole thing up. Because we're humans and that's what we do. Like, we're good at it, right? But Jesus is into redemption and new life. And how we answer these questions really has impact. Think about this. We're going to see more as we go through Acts, but the church starts to welcome in Gentiles and people that were not like them at all. And they struggle through that. This is not some easy thing. But they work through that, and the church starts growing and growing and growing and doing these things and growing through history. And, and right, you talk about communities renewed by the, blood, by the love of Jesus. That's what happens. And if they don't do that, then we aren't here. <laughs> so think about this. What if we, if we don't continue that work what happens two, three, four, five generations from now if we don't have that kind of mindset too? If we really want to see communities renewed by the love of Jesus, which is our vision for this church, then we have to believe that God can call anybody and that we are to welcome them as brothers and sisters in Christ. The book of Acts is not only our past, but it should be our present. The world looks different, culture is different, Technology is different, the strategy is the same. 
the gospel of Jesus Christ through the people of God. That's it. It's that simple. Because when people encounter Jesus and when the church welcomes them in, anything can happen. Like a villain becoming a hero or an enemy becoming a friend. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this incredible story. We thank you that you are constantly going after people, that you don't give up, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to come do what none of us could do, that he poured himself out, that we might have forgiveness of sins, that we might have a new life, and that you're doing more with that than we could ever imagine. We thank you for the story and the call of Saul who becomes Paul, who becomes all consumed by your spirit and your love and your mercy. And he lives a changed life. God, we want to do the same thing. So I pray for those in this room who are struggling to believe that at whatever level. God, take the scales from our eyes that we might truly see and that we might live the lives that you've called us to, and that, Jesus, we would see you do extraordinary things. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.